Master Leadership Podcast. Good to have you with us as always. I'm Becky Johnson, joined by my mentee. Co-host. Mm. Hero. I, I, <laughs> mentee is one option, but hero is probably, I think, probably more where I would fit. Joined by my hero. <laughs> Banning Leapshire. Uh, that, that sounds good. I like go. that. It's I like a new that introduction. a lot. So glad we can no longer say we're back because now we're in the full swing of things. Our reels are popping off. We are growing. <laughs> we're just, you know, the Jesus Culture Leadership Podcast. Can I tell you this real quick? Because when we started a podcast, it was, you know, there wasn't, there was stuff going on for sure. It's not like there wasn't. We were pioneers. But social media wasn't as big and all that type of stuff. And, and now it's just like before you just put a podcast out. Yeah. Like that, what you would that just, was it. You and would that re- was cool. Yeah. You'd record a podcast and you'd put a podcast out. Now you got to get clips and you got to get reels and you got to get oh, that. Yeah. Like it's way more like, can this I is- just record a podcast? And part of me, <laughs> you want to overturn the tables. You're a rebel. No, listen, here's where I'm at right now. Phil Mancinelli is our guest today. Phil, great to have you. Uh, we're going to jump into some stuff about what's behind you. He has a life Pacific pendant behind him. <laughs> pin That's it. right. Not pendant, pin it. Uh, which is cracking proud, me up. Uh, proud of my alma mater. <laughs> which is cracking me up. Like it. <laughs> what? Why like, are you just making fun of this man's education? I'm not education. making fun of Life Pacific. It's just funny that he's got a, a pennant hanging up, like Why it's is that like that? Uh, like it's Stanford or something. Oh my gosh! <laughs> which, well, by listen, the way, so, as like, the only listen. one, as the only one of the three of us that went to college, <laughs> I'm okay with it. <laughs> not only that, <laughs> not only that. Let me just say this real quick because I actually love Life Pacific. I'm not, not I'm not trying to make fun of Life Pacific no, at all. Forgive me for this. Some of the best leaders right now in the nation came out of Life Pacific. And that's Let's not a, and, and that's and that's and that's an absolute true story that some of the top preachers and ministry pastors in the nation Everybody wants to know those names right all now. come from Life Pacific. We that's can incredible. name them and you would know them. So I'm not making fun of it. It's just what you got, you know, you've got your Life Pacific, which I went to a Christian school exactly like that. Yeah. You just don't see behind me Vanguard. a Vanguard <laughs> pennant. Because hey, you only went hey, for a year. Hey, yeah, you don't get true. a pennant if you only go for a year. That's true. But here's guys tell me if this is wrong about how I think of things. There's so much marketing that goes into modern day church and ministry that part of me thinks, I just want to do none of that. And either there's an anointing on us and our content is strong or it's not. Yeah. Like I think often. This is another podcast. We did should Wesley? Do. Did Wesley and Whitfield and like like they just listen? I just heard Michael Culliano say. Oh uh, well, Michael's well, listen, in that mode. He pre- he was preaching from mm-hmm. Luke, and it said Jesus was moving in power, and word spread about him throughout yes. Galilee. And he goes, he looks at the camera, he goes, "Let me just tell you this: if you're anointed, you won't have to self promote." This is what I feel like <laughs> a little bit. I want to go like, listen, stop. But but you kind of have to play the game a little bit, it feels like, as far as you got to get it out there. But part of me wants to tell everybody, listen, listen, just be really anointed, mm-hmm. <laughs> walk in power, bring content that's changing lives, Yeah, yeah. and uh, that should, that'll be enough. There you go. That'll be enough. I just you, know, this... you don't need to get a degree in marketing to be in ministry. Oh, that's a good word. That's another, we should do that podcast. Phil's living this out right now. I agree. <laughs> in the process of oh, his yeah. book. That Phil's, is why I hate it all. he's on here. I do. I hate it hey, all. Hey, let me just real quick before we jump into the interview. Uh, Phil, I, I actually, Phil's one of my closest friends. Well, Phil was Kevin on the Atoll. last Jesus Culture he was. podcast this is with funny. me before you That's abandoned exactly that right. podcast for mm-hmm. pastors. Mm-hmm. Here's why I don't want Phil on the podcast Phil. right now. As a friend, as somebody that I care about, we're going to talk about the new book he wrote. Because of his pennant. About the course. No, it's about because it's baseball. <laughs> it's because of his baseball team. And oh. you would have no oh, clue. Gosh. You would have no. Do you intentionally bring no. sports up Listen, every podcast? Have... Let me just ask: Do you intentionally every podcast say I'm going to find well, a way well, to bring no, up yes. sports? Most people are out there. Most people are talking about sports, not uh, Broadway theater productions. You just or, cut to my face or right ma- now. Or most of us are not mathletes, <laughs> but right now his team is in the World Series. His team. And oh, I what just I just want to throw up. But the problem is the team they're playing I don't like the either. The beautiful so. Los Angeles Dodgers. He's a Dodgers oh, fan. Oh, I thought you would be a Braves fan. Well, you would think that living in the South, wouldn't you? But <laughs> nope. Why wouldn't you be a Dodgers fan? Because you're in California. That's Southern California. You have. I'm sorry. See, this would be. I, What's your baseball yeah. team? 
that you, giants. Are you that's kidding That's such me? a painful oh. and yet somehow sweetly well, there's naive. Also, like the Padres. <laughs> like everybody who doesn't wa- listen to everybody doesn't watch sports are like, this is the dumbest podcast ever. But listen to me, if you're a sports person, you would know this. We're in Northern California, not Southern California, okay? This isn't Southern California. We don't like Southern California teams. You, That'd be like so you weird. liking a theater group from Southern California. Inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> you have to have a loyalty to Northern California theater troops. What are they called? <laughs> Redirect. Let me just read. Oh, f- there it is. There it is. See, uh, just redirect that a little can't. bit. I just can't. Just to- so I'm going to get through this podcast talking to somebody that irritates me right now. So the Dodgers are in sports. the World Series with who else? Who else is in there? <laughs> the, the New the York, Sox? Ya- the New York Yankees playing the Yankees. Oh, it's about wow. as classic as World Series. That really getting, is. Though. It's going to be one of the highest rated. It's got superstars galore when is it? in it. Uh, we, let's not get into this right now. So, <laughs> I want to know. I need to be up to date on this. I do bring up sports a lot. This is a leadership podcast. You Every time. I, no, I don't think there here's is. Here's why. Can I we think, cut to a montage of every sports reference? I think reference? most great leaders come out of sports backgrounds. Well, that's dumb because that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think most, most U.S. senators, <laughs> most CEOs. Billy Graham, Catherine Everybody Coleman, that didn't play sports. Reiner is, Bunky. Oh, Billy Graham played sports. Oh, no, he didn't. <laughs> Catherine Kuhlman, nah, she probably didn't. She was definitely in theater. Oh my gosh. We'll give you definitely. Catherine. We'll Thank give you, you. Catherine she, Kuhlman. She was definitely in theater. She was definitely yeah. in theater. Thank you. I uh, we do we do bring this up, but Phil, it's great to have you. And uh, we have uh, enjoyed thanks. doing I'm the so leadership I'm so happy to be here. Thing. I'm excited. Feels like a, it feels like a little bit of home. Oh, it is. Well, I guess except for the horrible rivalry here. I apologize for that. Apologize for my co-host and hero. Uh, um, <laughs> A rivalry would kind of require that the other side won ever. Well, but yes, no. I hear you. He, he, I hear you. Maggie. Okay, we're not going to get this, but Giants, <laughs> Giants dominate. Giants have Giants have dominated in the last two decades, so we're fine. Uh, we are here talking with Phil Manginelli, a dear friend of ours, has been on the Pastors Podcast, has been on the Jesus Culture Podcast, the last iteration, a speaker at all of our events, and is definitely an extension of family. Phil Manginelli. Uh, Senior pastor of a church called The Square in the Atlanta area. Is your title senior pastor or lead pastor? Global founding pastor. Yeah, yeah. But outside of apistolic revolutionary, you know. um, No, it'd be lead lead pastor. Lead lead, pastor is the norm. It's lead catalytic dreamer and innovator. Are you guys into like lead pastor now over senior pastor? Is that too like old school? Is that too? I want to be called lead apostle. It just wouldn't go. Over I can real even well. tell you, I have a, uh, I have an opinion why. But yes, I have uh, adopted lead pastor over senior pastor. All right, so there you go, lead pastor of the church that it's he more planted. <laughs> that he planted how many years ago? Uh, Eleven years ago. Eleven years ago. It's a phenomenal church, and we love you guys very much. Um, I like you because I like your wife. Emily is a dear friend, and she's amazing. Um, And we're having you on. Well, we love you, but also it's a big moment for you. uh, Particularly, you released a book this week. Yeah, it came out. uh, You know, a couple days from when we're recording this. Um, But yeah, it's a wild thing to to walk through the entire process. And I was even telling Emily what was so. Part of it for me too was that I, I think I wrote the first uh, structural outline of a book I wanted to write on secularism maybe 12, 13 years ago. In that bizarre. So it's what what's wow. so strange is to have a story that's such a long yeah. story yeah. in my life finally kind of into the next phase or season. But it's amazing. No, it's been it's been a, it's been a joy. The book is called You Are Not Alone. And the tagline is a guide to following Jesus in a secular age. Okay, listen, I don't, I don't say this lightly, um, and I don't know, I wouldn't call myself an influencer by any, by any account on social media. But I, I talked about your book on Instagram a couple of days ago, and I said, I don't say this lightly. I, I honestly, and especially when there is so much noise, right? And everybody's writing books and everybody has podcasts. It's like, and you know, all your friends are like, Get, can you, can you talk about this for me? The most important message in this hour. Oh yes, it is things like that. And so I don't say things like that lightly and with all the white, I don't want what I say to be white noise. So I was trying to like apprehend the attention of whoever I could on my following to say, this is a book that is worth reading. Um, Phil, you've sent me, um, 
I'm going to have the book soon. I don't have the physical copy, but you sent me the PDF. I haven't read it all. I've looked through a lot of it. I am legitimately, we're going to have the Jesus Culture staff read through it. I have watched every reel you have posted, (laughs) been listening to the sermons coming out of your house on this topic. It is so significant and profound, this topic of secularism, the way you have navigated it and talked about it, the way that you live this message. I just think it's a book that every, every believer needs, honestly, like legitimately. In the Western church. In the Western church, yes, in the Western church for sure. So I want you to talk, we'll unpack just like 30,000 foot view of the book. For anybody not familiar exactly, I think we hear secularism a lot, but I don't know that everybody fully understands what that means in this context. Talk about the message of the book and um, yeah, start there. Yeah, well... And first, thanks, Becky. I know that um, I actually know that you what you just said is very sincere, and it means a lot to me. And of course, Banning wrote the foreword for it, and kind of has been walking with me through this whole process. So, uh, the truth is, I'm I'm just incredibly grateful and feel uh, very indebted to both of you, to Jesus Culture, and uh, for me, what I believe is that we're experiencing a, a crisis in the church. And I think as pastors and leaders, we feel it, we see it, we've felt it in our own lives, we feel it in the lives of people we love. You could talk to uh, countless people who have been in and out of churches, you could look at all of the statistics, and what you're seeing is the single greatest collapse of faith in uh, a culture that has ever existed. And for me, when when I actually begin to start to pay attention, it wasn't because I was aware necessarily of all of these things that were happening in the greater church. For me, it all started with a deep ache in my heart for my own friends, uh, that in a matter of a handful of years, some of my closest friends, people, not just people that I grew up with, not just people that were Christians, people I pastored alongside, people I was on the mission field with, one by one, they just began to walk away from their faith. And and what was so... uh, painful or, or or just challenging about it was th- their stories started from such different places. And then in the end, they they walked almost identical journeys. And there was just this moment, I, I write about it at the beginning of the book, where I was like, something is happening and something is happening to my generation. And it launched this pursuit that really in the last 15 years, I've given my life to understand and what I have come to the conclusion of, which many uh, significant voices and theologians and leaders have, which is that that in the middle of our lives has been this allowance of the culture around us, which we call secular, secularism, to come in not only to deeply impact and influence our faith, but in hidden ways actually intertwined to all of our beliefs and our convictions. And, and, and what I write about in You Are Not Alone is ultimately a vision of how understanding the belief system of our culture is going to actually help you understand the hidden stories and secrets and doubts of your own life. Because we have allowed our culture to become this powerful shaping force in our lives. And most of us without ever realizing it's happening. And and it's like this thing begins to take place inside of our souls where, because we actually have allegiance both to Jesus and to our culture, and they're going in two different directions, they begin to just almost pull us apart from the inside out. And I believe um, millions and millions of Christians are wrestling with stories of doubt, stories of fear, stories of pain, stories of uncertainty. And what they don't know is at the core of it, they're wrestling with secular stories. And I just believe that um, secularism or the belief system of our culture is this hidden ghost like hovering in the atmosphere of so many people's lives, robbing us of the freedom that we have in Christ, robbing us of really understanding what Jesus has done for us, and really robbing us of our future. So I wrote the book, uh, honestly, to contend for anyone who's experiencing those kind of storylines, that kind of hidden pain, those hidden doubts, that hidden anxiety, where there's just this internal wrestling between their life and the invitation of Jesus and the gospel or Christianity of the church, but they can't really name why. And while I, I wrote it very specifically to people that are walking through this, I believe that anybody who's pastoring, anybody who's leading, anybody who's caring for other people, it's not going to just be a resource to help understanding what's happening Anybody in the friends. lives of others. It's going to it's going to be a, a resource to even understanding themselves because I, it's even as I was writing the book, I was like, oh man, so many of these things 
are still wrestling points in my life. And without awareness, uh, it's it's a challenging thing to know how to keep inviting Jesus to have all of my life. So the so that's the kind of big picture vision of just how do we actually follow Jesus in the world that we live in. And I'm convinced we have to understand that world because when you un- this is what I believe when you understand secularism, you're not going to find a cultural philosophy. You're going to understand yourself. You're going to find your own stories. You're going to find the reasons behind things that have happening in your life that you didn't understand. And I think I would probably talk to. Um, when I obviously I'm not wrestling with my faith or the things that he's talking about, but for me, I'm walking with people. I'm not just talking about from a pastoral standpoint, just with people we love and friends and, and this type of stuff. And so one of the things that I've, I've really realized is there's a few areas where we feel extremely powerless in. Mm -hmm. We just feel powerless. Mm. So my, my finances, <laughs> we just feel powerless in finances. Relationships. Rel- relationships. We feel powerless in relationships. But navigating the current culture in the West and walking with people who are kind of being influenced by that is so overwhelming sometimes, and you feel so powerless in the midst of it. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to start. You don't fully understand it. Um, it feels complex, it, it, you know, all this type of stuff. And so I think f- what Phil's doing is not only wa- helping walking with people in a really pastoral, personal way for people, but also helping equip a whole ton of people to go, no, we can go engage this. You don't have to be, you know, and, and some people, they just get angry, you know, they just want to go culture war this thing. Mm-hmm. But but some of that is also just powerlessness. They just are like, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to get angry at all of it, rather than really understand it, walk with people, understand what God's wanting to do in the midst of it as well. Like God is wanting to do something in the middle of this that is going to see the greatest harvest the world has ever seen. What I'm telling you right now is what's happening in the nation with secularism, we are in America going to see the greatest harvest ever in the context of what is happening. Absolutely. And so I think it helps us to just to kind of get our head around it. Absolutely. Uh, Phil, can you talk a little bit, you know, there's so many um, causes in the part of secularism, (laughs) you know, there's just like, we are looking for meaning. So we're just getting behind cause after cause. And if you don't care, you're a monster, but you should care about this thing. And we've talked a lot about this with the political season right now and then social media. What I'm trying to do is help people understand guys, this is something you should care about. Like this actually matters. I think once they get there and they start to read the book, they start to get themselves, you know, get their mind wrapped around the the age of secularism and how we navigate as believers. But could you, and I don't know if you can, might be too loaded of a question, but maybe could, could you talk to people listening, like not about your book, but why is this a worthy thing to look at and not just, uh, be frustrated and walk away from, or like, don't be okay that you don't understand this. Don't be okay to just walk away from this. This matters. But I'm trying to get people to see why, even if with our own staff, I want you to know why this actually matters that you don't, it's not just pastors that should care about secularism or culture leaders or thought leaders. Like this matters for people to understand. Yeah. Um, Well, I think because if we want to see people free, we're going to have to learn how to undisciple people out of secularism mm. because the what the fruit of what secularism is doing is it just deforms your life and it shifts your life and ultimately i, the, I don't know how to describe it another way it's like this saran wrap you wrap around your own soul mm. so that the truth of god the power of god the freedom of god the transformation of god it, it, you can hear it but you can't receive it it just bounces off of your life and if we're ever going to see People walk in the radical freedom and the new creation power of Jesus, which we believe in, and the, and, yep. and the very things that Banny was talking about. It's it's because there's an awareness of what is actually the bondage that our generation is in, and the bondage that our generation is in is that without understanding it, we've given our allegiance to another culture, to another god, to another kingdom, to another set of beliefs, and we didn't realize we were doing that because on the front end, that you know, without a whole lot of understanding. They sound similar. Think if you think about the the like, what would you say are the main beliefs of a secular culture, at least in how they would represent them? Love, 
tolerance, kindness, equality, equity, what, whatever yeah. language you want to use, acceptance. They're they're all quite Christian sounding, and in their true representations, they all are deeply rooted in Jesus. But they actually are all completely inversed meanings of those concepts. So when Christians get connected to them, it actually begins to lead them in two different directions. And I would say there's a lot of things that we have to begin to see at the end of the day are connected to the story. Like uh, like we were just talking about with social media. So there's a lot of complex things with social media. But, but if we're honest, uh, one of the most complex parts of it is we all have this desire to be visible in a way that tells us we're meaningful. Why, yes. why do we feel that? That's because that's a belief system of secularism. Secularism believes that my life's meaning increases with the amount of visibility it has. And this is where I just want to say, as a pastor, I have that inside of me. I don't believe anything about a secular culture, but because I'm in the middle of it, those things are always bombarding me. And if I don't realize every time I'm trying to post something on social media, no matter how much my intentions are pure or right, or I just have to simply part of social media, right, that we all understand is it's where people are. So we want to take the message of Jesus to where people are, but at the same time are these like hidden desires of like, oh, if I was really important, if I was really meaningful, then this would get an X amount of visibility. And all the, the, the amount of those things that are happening in our lives, just, just think about you know, some of the conversations you've had recently and we've had recently about the nature of worship. Just, just think about how normal the question is, how was worship? And to not even pause when we ask that and go, oh, actually, that question, it's not only wrong, it's completely secular. The idea that I would take the concept of worship, which is a, an act of love and honor for God, something as a gift to him alone, that I would judge its goodness based on my own personal experience through it. And when you stop and you realize, oh, I actually turn worship into a drug to somehow have a euphoric experience to make myself feel meaningful. So I'm coming into church, I'm coming into my relationship with Jesus, and I'm literally using worship like a drug to soothe my own pain. And, and when you stop and you realize you're doing that, then you have to ask the question, is it actually worship at all? And, and this is the point where I'm saying it's an, it's everywhere. It's in everything. I mean, we could go list, you know, list after list after list. We are so indoctrinated by subtle secular beliefs, we can't even name them. Well, and listen, we know this. And, and I would say with worship in the point that he's making, in the presence of God, we find what he's talking about. You know, I, I don't, I'm not clarifying Phil right now, but, but it is in the presence of God that we find healing and comfort and yeah. oil, of joy. oil and, and that type of stuff. But we just naturally make ourselves the center of the story. It is, we just naturally make ourselves the center of the story. You know, secularism, I mean, is the extreme of that thing. Like we intentionally remove God and put yep. humanity at the center. What was the hardest part? What was the most you wrestled with when you're writing it? I think the thing I wrestled with the most was what I believe is that there are a lot of remarkable voices on issues around culture and biblical worldview and secularism, uh, some amazing theologians, some amazing uh, you know, people who've contributed. Like so much of what I know is well, built on listen, Francis the, the Schaefer, leadership of others. What you're talking about, Francis, obviously people have been, but Francis Schaefer was talking about this six decades ago around even yeah. words that people are using that don't mean the same thing but sound. Yep. L yeah, keep going. And he was one of those early prophets that we needed yes. to listen yes. to a lot more. So, so the hardest part of writing the book was actually knowing who I'm writing it to are the people who are everyday followers of Jesus. The, 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 the ache that was in my heart was that somehow the conversations, because they are about philosophy and you know worldview and, and you dive into things like metamodernism and Charles Taylor, and it just it has this way of going, oh, that's that's for the theologians or the philosophers or the intellectuals or the people who care about stuff like that. That's, that's not real life. And I think the desire in my heart was like, no, this is real life. Yeah. And I want to do everything I can to write a book for people like me. It, it, secularism took me a long time to understand. 
And because it is this like world that's hidden in the, yeah. the conversation of the few. And so the, the most challenging part of the book was just going, I want to help real people, you know, intellects and theologians, they've got all the stuff they need. People like me, people like the people that are in my church, they are the ones that need this, the, the message of transformation from our culture the most. So I think figuring out how to take all of these issues and all of these situations and bring them to the place that normal everyday followers of Jesus can understand them was the challenge. But it was also the joy because I, I, th- I think I did it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but I, but it was it when was you hard. accomplished it, was hard it, to it feels good. Well, I'm giggling at 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 Phil going. You know, normal like not intellectuals like normal like me. I'm like, well, the fact that you don't think you're an intellect- I know, <laughs> intellectual, totally. you're just, brilliant. There's no hope for me you're at all. Brilliant. No, I, I totally hear what you're saying, and I think that that's what you're. Yeah, you have masterfully made this accessible for everyday people, and I think that's what I was getting at. I have conversations with people about this a lot. And what I get from most people is like an almost immediate dismissal. Oh, that word is just like, oh, I can't understand that. Or it's not for me to care about. Or I'm like, no, if, if, you have, if you have four kids, <laughs> if you're a mom or dad of four young people right now, you absolutely should care and you're a follower of Jesus about secularism, um, about how it's showing up to your kids, how you're going to navigate that, how it's, because it is so crazy how it's just snuck its way into the Christian walk and 100%. it's diverted us off the path and the way of Jesus so significantly in ways that we just don't know. Why did you call it You Are Not Alone? I called it You Are Not Alone because I think that this is what secularism does to people. Mm. Is it actually, it, it's like this horror story inside your personal life and you're wrestling and you're wrestling and you feel like, am I failing? Is God failing? Is the church failing? Are pastors failing? Is the gospel failing? Is the problem me? Is the problem God? Is the problem Christianity? And there's such shame that gets wrapped around it that I find people, most people feel deeply alone in that uncertainty in their faith. And that was true for me because part of part of my own journey was coming to realize how much secularism had impacted my life. And it was the main reason it it was the belief system that built the stories and the pain of where I walked away from faith. And ultimately in God, God finding me in transforming my life, it was the journey back through secularism to finally understand him. And so what I really want to communicate through that title was just the simplicity that I actually believe that this is the greatest fear people are carrying when they're bound by certain things is that they're alone, that nobody can understand them, that they're walking through a story that doesn't make sense to anyone else. Because what secularism does is it, it manipulates your own pain. And because your own pain is so personal, it is hard to communicate. It is hard to explain. So, so many people are like, Oh, it's just, it's a me thing. But what they're not admitting is that they're lonely and they're terrified And I just think what I wanted to say is what I've learned, which is you're not alone. Millions of millions of believers are walking through the same wrestling as you are. And you're also not alone because Jesus is the God who meets us in those places and brings transformation into our life. Let me ask you this, Phil. It's a random question. Phil, as you know, cries every time he preaches. (laughs) It's a there's got to be some stats somewhere. Is it 90 (laughs) percent? 90%. 90%. It's, it's 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 a if you were going to grade it it would be an A. Not it, sure which it, one. It would be but, up there. Know. Do you also cry while you're writing? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's this interesting paradox because I don't cry often outside of te- I mean I do. I, I cry <laughs> when I teach all the time, but then Have you been with I'm him? I love normal, it. I, we I'm talked in, about it. It's beautiful. I'm in normal interactions. I'm like, I think I should be crying right now. You're heartless. You're a cold heartless individual until you preach. So there's So what I did find, I wrote maybe five stories in my own life that are these like really the 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 most shaping moments of my life. And but I've I've told these stories before, I've preached these stories a lot, but there was something about writing them that felt different. It felt vulnerable. And I do remember specifically even even the story that's in the intro about so my 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 friend Jake who passed away. I was writing it. In the, on notes in my phone. I remember I was just actually, I was sitting outside my house writing that story. And um, oh man, and I was like having to wipe my phone yeah. off from the tears that were just dripping on it. Cause 
part of it for me was, oh, gosh, gosh dang it, Danny. <laughs> like, for me, writing the book was like, oh, I'm free. Yes. Like, like this, it was almost this place for me to go, Jesus rescued me. Yes. I'm not writing about theory. I'm, I'm uh, fundamentally everything I'm talking about is is factual in the world we live in. But I'm also writing about like this was my life. I walked away from Jesus because I was bound by my culture's belief system, and I also found the Jesus that like burst through every single barrier that I placed yeah, and found on. me. Yeah. So. For me, I think the mo- the emotional part of the book where it did show up was like, oh man, what what God has done in my life is more than I. Yeah, it's incredible. I, I could have ever deserved. So. Hey, not only do you have a book, uh, you have two other resources that you just launched. One is a twelve week curriculum. What would it be? Mm-hmm. Small group discipleship material. Yeah, so we just we call it this Jesus and Secularism Discipleship Course, and it's twelve video teachings and twelve discipleship guides to go alongside all twelve of the chapters. So the heart is that a church or a small group or a group of people could take this alongside the book and have kind of a deeper discipleship journey through it. And you also have recently released a podcast. On our podcast. network. On our network, on the Jesus Culture Podcast Network, uh, Resistance and Renewal. Renewal resistance. Oh, which man. one? Which, Resi- which one goes first? Resistance and renewal. <laughs> uh, uh, resistance. What's your? Why'd you call it resistance renewal? What's your heart for the podcast? Yeah, we just uh, just launched our second episode. Banning was our first. John Tyson was our second. It's a. It's just an awesome <laughs> you conversation. Can, you tell which one was probably a better conversation. <laughs> Banning was the first one. He's like the opening act. He's like the guy that comes out and entertains the crowd before the real guy comes on. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, that's not true, but funny. <laughs> um, it's how John Tyson makes all of us feel. Yes, that's, agree, that's the, agree. The reality. So the heart behind it, right? Romans 12, 1 through 2 is this verse that is the defining, I think, verse of the, the, the latter half of my life, what I feel like I'm supposed to give the rest of my life to. And in an essence, Paul says that he's inviting to the life with Jesus is this life of true worship, this living sacrifice laid down before God. And and then in the very next verse, he just kind of describes what that life looks like. And he says, do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And and it's here that you'll understand the good and, and uh, perfect and pleasing will of God. And I just think that there's this picture of what does a life of true worship look like? What does a life of full allegiance to Jesus look like? And I think it looks like a life that resists the things that are conforming uh, the false realities of this world. And I think it looks like a life of renewal that's transformed by the power of God, the power of the word and the power of the Holy Spirit. And so that's the simple vision is in the middle of the culture that we live within, I want to live a life of true worship. And I want to I walk with people to teach and to join me in a life of resistance and a life of renewal. I love it. All right, this is the question as we wrap up that Becky has 100% been wanting to ask. I could just just see her leaning into it. Dodgers and how many? And you're gonna, I'm putting this on tape right now. <laughs> Listen, I'm putting this right now recorded for everybody to hear. Let's hear how accurate your prophetic is. One, is it even the Dodgers? I'm going to assume so because you're such a diehard fan. But Dodgers and how many? Listen, I think uh, I think it's going to be Dodgers and seven. Well, you think it's going to go to Game Seven? Do you know what Game Seven means? I really do think it's going to be Judge versus Otani. It's just going to go back and forth, and Otani and home field advantage. Dodgers yeah, going to pull it off. There we go. Of all the sports to care about or to know about, you think that baseball? <laughs> the fact yes. that you grew up, how far away was Wrigley Field from you? Forty-five minutes an hour. The fact that Wrigley Field was forty-five minutes away from you. Yeah. Go Cubbies. Wrigley Field. <laughs> one of the best experiences I've ever had in life yep. is going to uh, a, a Cubs game. It's just so epic. I was with you. I know. And you don't have any like... <laughs> we were there. Like, I loved it. It was awesome. All right. That's how it works. It's okay. Well, Phil, thanks for joining us on the G's Culture Leadership Podcast. The book it's, is on Amazon. Yeah. You can buy it wherever books are sold. Well, I don't know. Which probably isn't Could true. Because I don't know. get it wherever know. books are sold. Um, Could you get it at Books online? A Million? Books a online. Million? Wherever um, yeah. Yeah. Wherever wherever books online. are sold. Books are sold. And uh, excited to have you part of the Jesus Culture Podcast Network family. 
Always great to have you on there. Uh, Join us. You want to check that out. You also are a regular contributor to our School of Leadership. You're a regular contributor to all of our pastors' conferences that we do. So we love having you around. We love you, Phil. Thanks so much. Love you guys. 